Our national media and our politicians stress his martyr's death at the hands of an assassin while leading a garbage book described in Memphis, Tennessee. And while it is considered in the New York Times a form of art worthy of public financing to depict Christ suspended in urine, anyone who portrayed Martin Luther King with less than icon I iconic reverence, reminiscent of medieval depictions of Christ, who be moved professionally and socially. Recently, U.S. News and World Report noted that for Americans between the ages of 18 and 25, Martin Luther King is viewed, quote, as the most respected person in all of human history. Over Winfrey places fifth, well ahead of his time. In his best selling uh, collection of political sermons, God's Politics, Jim Wallace rejoices, quote, My son Luke attends the school. When the teachers made so much of Black History Month in February, Luke is now getting the same things at school that we teach him constantly at home. Books about Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. At the end of Black History Month, Luke announced to me and to my wife, I'm going to be just like Martin Luther King, except I will have a different name and a different skin. Uh, of course, nothing could have pleased us more, unquote. Not surprisingly, there was nothing in Wallace's book which was on top of the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction books, actually, which would qualify as fiction, that Luke has ever been exposed to the Bible, except possibly in the context of his father's advocacy of certain social programs. Nor can one say that Christianity's founder receives in God's politics the same degree of awe as the assassinated king. Jesus seems to move throughout this work like an Arab social worker. More like a blog on an anti war, anti Bush website. Bush and King's birthday comes at the beginning of another key event in our new liturgical calendar of Black History Month, which is followed by another month long showcase of what is presented as an epic struggle against prejudice, this one dedicated to women. Needless to say, Women's Month is not centered on motherhood, a condition that earlier revolutionary liturgical calendars such as the ones in Jacobin, France, or Communist Russia, paid on to. Instead, we are urged to praise such women as Betty Friedan and Susan B. Anthony, both feminists prepared women for the gender revolution that our current public administration promotes. A sign on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which uh, thankfully has been removed by now, and uh, was put by the National Organization of Women, explains that many women had to give their lives for the right to vote. Contrary to this false assertion, intending to build a post modern church on the bones of female martyrs, no woman, as far as I know, ever gave her life to extend the right to vote to other women. The extension of the franchise was the work of men. Furthermore, the American South and in the Midwest enjoyed the support of nativist men, who favored extending the suffrage to their Anglo Saxon spouses to offset the political influence of Latin and Slavic immigrants. We were also occasionally made to celebrate civic saints who performed double duty, such as Harriet Pump and the black woman who smuggled slaves from southern plantations mm -hmm. into northern states. Miss Tubman, by the way, is rated second place in survey results in US News World Report, which tells us something about public education in the United States. <coughs> Another Christian, post Christian saint who ranks very high in the list is Eleanor Roosevelt who had the advantage of far left political affiliations and was once an advocate of the quotations of women's rights. Mrs. Roosevelt was someone who enjoys considerable attention throughout the women's month. But her hagiography ignores the fact that she tirelessly campaigned for a single family wage, one that would keep women out of the workplace and which would allow husbands to provide food and housing for the mothers of their children. The single family wage which feminists in the US have packed as a male sexist creation was the paramount goal of American feminists throughout the early 20th century. It was long seen by such champions for women's rights as Mrs. Roosevelt and the American Secretary of the Treasury under her husband's administration, Francis Perkins, as necessary for the protection of women who wish to be mothers and homemakers. Although I have no sense of apologists for the horrible crimes committed by the Nazi regime, a way of parent and members of my family, there is something noteworthy and not entirely pleasing about how Germans obsess over their unequal historical nastiness. This Teutonic fixation has taken two forms, frenetically extending Nazi-like behavior or omens of the Third Reich to the entire course of German history, 
and take an orphan delight in any threat to continue German national existence. Only Germans would organize large mass demonstrations to applaud the firebombing of German civilians in Hamburg and Westen in the Kunden Mass World War II. Furthermore, one could not imagine any other nation that would create any national movements to tens of thousands devoted to destroying the remnants of their already battered national identity. The proud observation by Germany's past foreign minister, Joshua Fischer, that Auschwitz is a founding myth of the German Republic is only the preliminary first step for German political officials and educators playing out their country's special burden. This collective self basing which requires, among other things, that German historical studies always blame Germans for all international strife, even when both sides seem to be responsible as in the case of the First World War or the French Prussian War, is so pronounced that one has to be, uh, I think it would be unsighted rather than blind, because I thought I was giving this originally before you put it to the French audience, not to know this is eccentricity. But here, too, we are dealing with something that is culturally specific. Shintoist Japanese do not beat their breasts because Japanese soldiers committed murder and mayhem against the Chinese and other Southeastern Asians. Nor does the Eastern Orthodox Church exhort the Russian people to ask the world's forgiveness for Soviet Russian crimes. After all, it was the former Russian government that murdered even more people than Nazis, as Yuri pointed out. Moreover, when the Poles were charged with having killed more than a million Germans and having expelled at least that number from those territories they occupied in World War II, their leaders simply explained the Germans had it coming. When the descendants of Polish Jews in America complained that Poles had actively cooperated with the Nazis to get rid of Poland's Jewish population, Polish historians insisted these charges were overblown. Indeed, Polish American historian Mara Podigiewicz who works at the World Institute of Politics, produced a hefty monograph on Polish Jewish relations, 1944 1947, but whose work has been translated and widely distributed in Poland, demonstrates the Polish Jewish leaders and treats was far more complicated than Polish critics recognize. This goes on and on. Um, uh, the point being uh, that the Poles do not run around beating their breasts about. Uh, real or alleged crimes committed against other people who seems to be uh, peculiar, as I would argue, to certain Western countries and most dramatically uh, to the German, the case of the German. But an equally suspect occurrence, the defacing of Jewish tombstones in Cologne in 1959, an act that has Stasi's German fingerprints all over it, and which came during a delicate crisis in East West relations, was not viewed with comparable doubt. German intellectuals, journalists, and educators used the occasion to condemn the German people for not having faced up to their past. This act of desecration unleashed a series of laws and demonstrations against fascism and neo fascism that went on for decades and whose effects, as reflected in German public discourse, um, uh, are reflected in German public discourse and have resulted in a serious uh, attack, I would argue, on civil liberties in Germany. But here, too, a distinction must be drawn between German Protestants and German Catholics. The prolonged fits of guilt and masochistic confessions that go with the politics of shame are far more characteristic of German Protestants than of their Catholic fellow citizens. Ever since the Evangelical Church of Germany issued its first declaration of guilt, what it really is, the Schulz, uh, Schulz at, uh, at Bell, uh, in October 1945, if spokespersons have been taking responsibility on behalf of their people for every political misfortune which the German government was involved. These self condemnations now extend from Nazism to the First World War, from there to Bismarck, Frederick Gray, all the way back to coming through his unkind references to Jews and his Tisha, his tablecloth. And even before the Germans became a recognizable um, uh, a nation, it would crusades that contemporary Germans are still nationally. Over and over the treatment of the Guerreros in Namibia, West Africa, which now in some ways is even coming to overshadow, uh, at least for some leftist intellectuals, the Holocaust. These periodic blood and of course, these bloodbaths in the Middle Ages are linked exclusively on the West and more particularly on the Germans. Uh, since the 1990s, world, the self accusations of the German Evangelical Church. Uh, had an ample amount to encompass now widely mentioned problems in a phobia. 
the lack of a welcoming attitude for third world immigrants, German Protestants are told, is a sickness of the soul, and a very great one, that the Bishop of Berlin, Berlin Brandenburg, attributes the residual toxin of German nationalism. Presumably, his congregants would have to work harder not to notice the soaring crime rates in their cities. So self incrimination is far less obvious among Catholic dignitaries, even in Germany. For example, Karl Carter Lehmann of Mainz has scolded uh, Islamic fundamentalists with their intolerance of Christians and their deplorable treatment of their wives and daughters. Unlike the evangelical bishop of Berlin, Wolfgang Hubel, and his fellow Protestant church from the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who has been known to make some statements, Lehmann, like other German and Austrian Catholic dignitaries, is opposed to bringing Sharia law to one of Christian countries. Another critical distinction may be called for before proceeding further. Although American Catholics often favor Latin American immigration and typically vote for left of center political parties, more, much more typically, in fact, than American Protestants, their clergy are less inclined, I would argue, than mainline Protestants to dwell on political correctness. This is the point that Thomas C. Reeves has little trouble demonstrating in his book, Empty Church. And even more relevant, it is hard to find in Catholics the religious motivation for social guilt that is increasingly characteristic of Protestants. It might be said that while well, Catholics more frequently than Protestants support the left in the US, Canada, and England, they do not do so because they are religiously driven. They are embracing their positions because they believe themselves or their ancestors to have suffered under a Protestant majority. Equally important, they do not view themselves in most cases as applying religious principles and certainly not Christian ones. In public life. It is not unusual to encounter young or even middle aged Catholics who say that they personally believe that abortion is homicide. Still, these respondents don't want to force their views, or at least not these particular views, on anyone else. Such a stance is so laden uh, with contradiction, presumably such barriers of tolerance, without any trouble sticking on someone else's throat the latest legal offenders doctrine, that one is forced to infer those things. That do not really matter for Spear are precisely the ones that we tolerate in the state of subsidize. What is irrelevant in any case is a traditional religious conscience, which does not usually explain why Catholics are to be found on the cultural and cultural left. But the Protestant case, I would argue, is different. Protestant teachings and habits have played a crucial role in creating, at least in the United States, uh, politics of shame. Meditation on its fallen state attempts to distinguish the righteous from the sinful. Public declarations of collective remorse as signs of one's election are in the United States the traits of the traditional Protestant culture, and all of these traits can be found in our mainland churches. These are institutions whose leadership has been sliding for decades for the multicultural left, and they vastly assure now exists that underscore how far reaching the effects of these tendencies have been. Uh, uh, a process similar to the one described in uh, books that I, I cite here went on among Protestant leaders and spokesmen in the early and mid 20th century. Back then, it took the forms of bewailing imperialism and engaging in communist fellow travel. Thus, we have spectacles of such Protestant clergymen as Hugo Johnson in Canterbury in the 1940s and the Congregationalist Chaplain at J.O. Winslow and Hall in the 1960s. And many, many Quaker clergy, well, and people associated with the Quaker Church, in their capacities, who belong to communist front organizations, uh, making jewel and pilgrimages to communist states, or extolling African socialist dictators. Now we find another version of Western self protection <coughs> uh, in forms that are at least partly motivated by religious impulse. For evidence of this new Protestant fashion, the readers refer to Jim Wallace's book. Which provides a certain theological justification <coughs> for these secular social reforms. But Wallace and his clerical devotees and his readers reject the idea of Christian radical politics as a Christian public activity. They were more than willing to hail secularism as the fulfillment of Christian piety. Wallace extends an invitation to impoverished third world populations, quote, to enrich our geographical space. No longer do supposedly enlightened Protestants expiate their sins by visiting and praising left wing dictatorships across the globe. Instead, they try to rebuild their societies by welcoming the rest of the world. 
If the American working class recoils from the Christian terror while this explains the great reckoning, the reason is that you're economically insecure. But this is not your, the fault of the illegal immigrants, but of the national economic policy, the morally flawed budgets, and the lack of living wages from huge corporations. Apparently, Wallace has never discovered that huge corporations and their defenders at the Wall Street Journal have been at the forefront of those demanding amnesty for illegal residents in the U.S. Cheap labor in the case of big business easily trumps that phobia. No term one school is not an entirely accurate description of what the Protestant secularists wish to free the Western world from. His or her group also includes the once indiscreet saints who are now making their presence known through public contrition and outpourings of social guilt. The majority of Christian population that does not stand in the saintly company belong to an unredeemed xenophobic world. One deserve that it deserves to perish as the final age of global citizenship is imagined to be approaching. The solemn renunciation by the saints of public recognition of Christianity, a habit that is thought to make others feel comfortable, is viewed as a very modest step in the war against Western small mindedness. No reciprocity is, of course, demanded from the other side, which enriches by merely standing on our soil. Let me point out that what I sketched is the set of religious attitudes that I encounter daily in my workplace. Every day I meet the people I have been evoking as a professor at German Pietist College in Pennsylvania, which still bears, however distorted in fashion, the imprints of its founding. Not surprisingly, the Christian core of the college has given way to a center for global citizenship. And the pronouncements coming from our president celebrate diversity and internationalism, quote, as expressive of our school's traditional religious mission, unquote. When the remaining clergy on campus are asked whether the secularist mission really embodies their belief, my question never fails to occasion wonder. It seems foolish that I would be asking. In a certain sense, I am witnessing the fulfillment of the prophecy found in a book that created a splash when I was in graduate school in the mid-1960s. Harvey Cox's The Secular City. This widely read analysis of Protestant outreach, which was also a statement of the deepest conviction of the author, a Harvard professor of theology, viewed the secularization of his religion as a sign of his triumph. Cox's view is that seculars are on the right track when they try to be Americans, quote, away from their healthy reliance on the God figure, unquote, in order to achieve the kind of social progress that the Bible only hints at. We must first become, in quotations, true human beings, and we must abandon the childish doctrines taught by organized religion over the centuries. Unquote. Such opinions are not only widespread in today's theology departments, as the profusion of critical literature and the testimony of divinity schools would reveal, they also point to a specifically Protestant path of secularism, which must be distinguished from other paths leading away from traditional religious belief. Although these paths lead to sectors occasionally intertwine, they are nonetheless different from each other. Muslim religious skeptics are more likely to become Arab nationalists than they are to become advocates of mass immigration and cultural mixing. Uh, it is also inconceivable that third world sectors would expend energy apologizing to other nations and national minorities whom their people once heard are offended. As far as I can ascertain, there is no Buddhist or Hindu politics of guilt. And to the extent that such flora and fauna have taken root among Christians, it generally thrives best and will not exclusively in secularizing Protestant societies. Let me close by calling attention to what I am not saying. I do not mean to suggest that Northern European Protestants and their North American counterparts have never acted badly in their history. Demonstrably, they have, as of all other groups, to this the same extent. Moreover, Western Protestant societies have expressed deep remorse over their misdeeds, including exaggerated and often invented ones. Uh, and like most of the rest of the world, they have tried to make amends for past wrongs. They have also made available to the rest of humanity the fruits of their economic productivity, having health standards, educational institutions, and aid to underdeveloped societies. But in addition to doing these things, they have made a fetish and beating up on their ancestors and viewing their civilization as more sinful than the rest of the human race. And this thing has become more noticeable the farther one moves historically from what is being implored. 
The self-incrimination is always expanding and coming. And it now includes even such normal human practices as drawing gender distinctions or preferring heterosexual or homosexual families. Finally, I am not condemning the fathers of the Protestant Reformation or traditional Protestant theology for this derailment. I, uh, uh, I focus on Luther, seemingly Cranmer, or Calvin, had nothing to do with what others did to their ideas hundreds of years later, for reasons that no one in the 16th or 17th century could have possibly foreseen. What we're dealing with is a twisting of what my friend, Cross theologian, Brent Havers, calls the obligation of charity into something very different, and the appeal to a distinctly non metaphysical guilt in order to generate total commitment on the part of the believer to a faith substitute. What allows this development to occur are forces that do not exist until well into the modern era. Uh, for example, the identification of justice and charity, equality, the treatment of any sort of inequality as evidence of wickedness. Because of other stress on the equality of all believers, their heightened sense of individuality, and their tendency to brood on its own sin as an existential condition. Protestants have been at special risk to succumb to certain modern political temptations. But the emphasis here should be placed on the word modern or contemporary, lest we anachronistically ascribe the weakness discussed to those of the distant past. My interest is in showing how old habits of thinking can be made to serve current ideologies. They should be distinguished from indulging in the now widespread vice of sitting in moral judgment over the past. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.